Welcome, I'm Dr. Jennifer Walinga, and I'm a professor at the School of Communication and Culture at Royal Roads University. And no, it is not episode 19. I just realized I forgot to change the first slide of my PowerPoint. But uh, this is Winning Better, and we're going to be talking about new metrics for measuring a safe, healthy, inclusive, excellent sport environment. We have some fantastic guests. And it is, it is kind of an anniversary for us, our 20th webinar over the past few years. And uh, I just want to thank my, my co-star here, Emma Angus, Amara Angus, because Amara has been with me right from the beginning. And uh, we are kind of feeling like a little bit of a road show here, the two of us. We're going to go on the road into Toronto in a few weeks as well and deliver some more great uh, material uh, that's relevant to what we do here at Royal Roads, but also I think so relevant to what we talk about here in the webinar around values and values-based leadership and positive social change and, and via sport, right? Through sport, we have a guest a panelist, Andrea Wools, who's representing Via Sport, and she was just sharing that that's what that name means, right? Through sport. So a lot of what we talk about here as well, the power of sport, what we can do through sport, and how we can leverage sport. I always start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from my home office here, but also on the campus, we are coming to you from the Lekwungen and Quisepsen, uh territories, unceded territories that are also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. We always want to acknowledge, of course, where we are and the truth of our history that has been off, often forgotten and rarely taught uh, and really spend some time bringing that back into our realities, into our knowledge, into our awareness, spend our time learning how to bring Indigenous ways of being, learning and, and believing and thinking into our ways of doing as well. We always want to thank the First Nations for their for allowing us really to be on these lands and to live and work and play here. I also spend a lot of time on this little territory, a Masonic territory, on the Elk Lake, going backwards in my little skinny boat. And I like to highlight this image because um, I was out in it this morning, and it's always teaching me something. There's so much truth in sport. So this at webinar really highlights the value and potential that sport can bring our society. Uh, and I encourage everyone to lean on sport, their sport or their experiences in sport when they're feeling a bit stuck or troubled. It often holds the truths. Lately, my sport's been teaching me patience. <laughs> patience and also recently I just raced and it was all about adaptability and embracing the uh, adversities and excitement of a four and four and a half K race down on the Charles. We spent a lot of time at Royal Roads learning from the land. It's a very ecological model as a learning, teaching and research model. Uh, we are interdisciplinary. We're mainly focused on facilitating positive social change or positive social sustainability. Uh, human and social development as the focus of all of our programming at Royal Roads. And we can't ever lose sight of that because the land is constantly telling us and reminding us of those truths of how much we must rely on each other, how interdependent we are, how much we rely on diversity, and, uh, and how we really need to take care of ourselves, one another, and our environment. I also like to highlight this image. It's an image our School of Communication and Culture relies on heavily the idea of a bridge and that to build a bridge, whether it's a hug or a handshake or a structure or a uh, process, we need to understand the differences, minding the gaps before we can actually bridge a gap and how important it is to embrace diversity, embrace differences as we try to function together as, a, as humankind on this earth. And, this, and sport has so much to teach us about those kinds of principles. Sport has a great power to bring communities together and to advocate for equal rights and uh, to demonstrate just the power of humanity really when we link arms and support one another. You know, there's no winning without lifting others up. And at Grow Roads, all of our programs reflect a lot of these same concepts and values of development, diversity and inclusion, education, environmental sustainability, equity and human rights, health, communication and peace. We have multiple partnerships at Rural Roads, and many of them center around sport. We're, we're in a city, the Victoria, BC, that is uh, home to probably more NSOs than anywhere in Canada because of our year-round capability for training. 
but we have uh, a few professional leagues here as well. And it's just a really ripe community uh, that embraces sport and a great place for, for us as a university to build those kinds of partnerships. So our, our flexible admission policy actually em embraces that as well. And we welcome athletes in just like we do working professionals, acknowledging their professional experience for credit. I just want to plug that always, because I know a lot of athletes, especially now they're so centralized that they struggle to find time to go to school, but there are flexible ways to do that uh, at many institutions across Canada, but rural roads is one of them. We also are developing programming around, we have these concepts of governance, leadership and, and social change within all of our programs, but we have customized some programming to focus in on sport itself. And another little partnership I'm very proud of is working with the CFL Players Association. We delivered some leadership training with them, but also with them, um, I should highlight Sports Scientists Canada and a number of people here on the call have actually experienced some of that learning uh, across Canada with the support of On the Podium. So our webinar series really started during COVID and it was uh, a, a real nugget of joy for me because it was an opportunity to start reaching out across the community and bring people together to have important conversations. We're noticing a number of crises in sport, of course, you hear about one almost every day, the most recent being, and probably the most, um, probably the most kind of engaging socially across Canada was Hockey Canada going through their challenges. And we're all learning, really, we're all learning together. And that's what today's episode is about. How do we, how do we move from this focus on surveillance, identifying abuses and conflicts and um, uh, governance issues, uh, violence, cheating in sport, identifying, calling those out, you know, addressing those, sanctioning, et cetera, uh, investigating, et cetera, but move from there to also examining the environment and how do we create an environment that can prevent those kinds of crises from emerging. And that's why our panelists today have been brought together to share some of their case studies and stories examples, but also to explore more deeply what are the what are the salient elements that are in place to foster healthy, safe, sustainable, uh, inclusive environments that are also excellent experiences in sport. So winning better, the new gold standards of sport leadership. How do we lead sport in a way that prevents, that, that um, shuts the door to these kinds of abuses from creeping in? How do we create governance that's so solid that uh, people are safe and healthy no matter what, right? That should be our goal, I think, instead of just focusing on safe sport. So what does excellence in sport look like? What are the metrics? What are the measures? What are the success indicators for safe, healthy, quality sport? And that's not to say that uh, we are letting go of high performance. High performance is really important to a number of people. But it's also a small population across our country and across the world. Not many people get to go to the Olympics <laughs> or any kind of high performance event. And it isn't the main uh, focus of sport. There are a number of different values in sport and, and rewards that we can gain by participating in sport. So let's keep in, keeping our perspective on that. Um, and I like to always introduce that concept of excellence. I like the word excellence because excellence um, can mean an excellent experience in sport can mean something for a little tiny Timbit soccer player who uh, happens to make a new friend or uh, have a great time running up the field and kicking a ball to the person who's standing um, you know, on the, on the podium at the end of a, a career and, and achieving their goal of being the best in the world within their, their category and being able to wrap their arms around their fellow winners on that podium and, and feeling that they are brothers and sisters, you know, that they're linked up in this wonderful endeavor of, of pursuing excellence at its very highest. So excellence can mean many things. So welcome to our wonderful panelists. I'm so grateful to all of you for participating. We have Megan Foster, who's a certified coach developer with Skate Canada and founder of Mosaic Engagement Organizational Consulting. And we'll ask each of our panelists to share a bit more about themselves. I have a few questions designed to do that, and reveal a little bit more about yourselves personally and professionally. We have Alana Lieberman, who's a safe sport lead with Sport Nova Scotia, a lawyer and author with a focus on restorative justice and child protection. Jeff Powell, 
CEO of Canadian Sports Center Manitoba and world champion rower from 2002, 2003, and Olympian in 2004. And Andrea Wool, Safe Sport Manager with Via Sport BC and an organizational coach and many more things. As you know, people in sport always wear a thousand hats and are always very busy, involved in so many things and getting things done. So let's, uh, we'll meet our guests in a moment, but I also want to remind our panelists and thank, or sorry, our participants, thank all our participants. We have a record number of registrants today, which is kind of cool for our 20th episode. And uh, you'll all get the, the recording, of course, and you can share that as widely as you want. We encourage that for sure. And I'll do some post webinar posts as well, highlighting some of the, the key concepts that have emerged. But please post questions in the chat and there will be opportunities for you to weigh in as well. Turn a mic on if you're comfortable and we'll have more of a discussion as a, as a whole group. Again, we're all learning together. So I always wanna involve any, everybody and anybody that's keen. And there is lots of contact information that we will make available afterward as well. And we will also make available the resources that emerge in the discussion. So people will all often give a little plug or a shout out, or they'll point to a resource. So we wanna make sure we capture those and share those with you on our website afterwards as well. And of course, you can always find all the recordings there. And we have a couple of episodes coming up that are, that are in the planning stages. So dates to be announced, but working on one around uh, research and community sport, uh, yes, around safe sport, but also governance and policy and how can we support our community sport leaders a little more effectively. We've got Haley Baxter and Katie Meisner tagged for that one. Episode 22 is around caring for survivors. So safe sport process is evolving and, and really growing and developing into something quite clear and solid. Uh, but one key component of that is that idea of how do we better care for victims and survivors of abuse through that process. It's, it's a real gap and a devastating one, actually, because it's just another way that people end up uh, abused or re-traumatized through the process. And we have the wonderful Sandra Kirby and Delphine Colin Vizina, who's a clinical psychologist, and Erin Wilson, who's been doing such great work with Athletes Can and, and work with her own research as well under Gretchen Kerr. And that's it, let's end that and uh, stop sharing and get us into our big plenary, I love it. Of course, you can adjust your view so that you can highlight or pin your panelists if that's of interest to you. Great to see some people on video, love it. And also, Oh, great to see you, Walter. <laughs> Some great friends who always join in. Wonderful to see. Uh, and just remember that you can, and we welcome you to turn on your mic a little bit later in your video uh, to ask questions or, or to comment or share some of your own experiences. We'll make some room for that as we go, okay? All right, so let's just start by, I, I always like to give people an opportunity to share a little bit more about themselves in terms of sport. So I want to start by asking each of our panelists, share a little bit about your journey into sport. How did you find yourself involved in sport and what kind of roles did you play? Because not everybody's an athlete, right? Lots of people volunteer in different ways or they participate as a spectator or as an official or a coach. There's all sorts of ways to participate in sport, but also your reasons for staying with sport. You've all committed a lot of your life to sport in many different ways, personally and professionally. So you can uh, shed a little light on that as well. And when you're ready, just turn your mic on and then I'll know that I've got a, someone that's ready to rock or I'll just volunteer you, that works too. Anybody want to start? I'll start. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I'll start um, so that you don't ask me first next time. So there we go. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me as a, as a panelist today. My name is Alana Lieberman. I am um, the Safe Sport Lead with Sport Nova Scotia. And I've been there since January of 2020. Um, I'll give you a little bit more background of, as to my professional life, but my sporting career, to answer Jennifer's question, um, I participated in a sport that actually doesn't exist really truly anymore. Um, I was a freestyle skier way back in the day. I was a ballet, um, I think they call it acro ski now, but I was a ballet skier um, in the 80s. And um, I got into it primarily because my brother was a racer, a ski racer. And so I didn't want to do what my brother was doing. So back then, for those of you who might be of my vintage, it was called hot dogging. It was sort of 
becoming a little bit more streamlined and I competed throughout uh, North America and uh, Ontario primarily, but uh, throughout North America as a freestyle skier. Um, after leaving skiing, I stayed uh, in sport through my degree at Western, my first degree at Western. And throughout my life, I have participated in various sports, but I'm also the mom to uh, two athletes. And so that will frame some of the comments that I have later today. So um, that's my journey through sport. And Alana, I'm going to keep you for a minute. And what, what makes you stay with it? Oh, my goodness. Well, that's the answer. That's the answer to the questions that are coming later. But um, legacy. It's about legacy. It's about having the memories that um, I certainly had, the the friendships that I made, the, the ability to tell stories with a smile. Um, and that's what I hoped when I started with my position with Sport Nova Scotia. And that's what I hope for my children and the children and the young athletes that are participating in sport. And, that, and I'll talk a little bit about that, that legacy piece. Um, and so that's what, that, what's what keeps me in it. That's what started me in it. And that's what hopefully will keep me going. Thank you. Great. Legacy, love it. Who'd like to go next? Great, Andrea. Um, first of all, like just thank you so much for inviting me. And it's so great to see these these faces on here. And um, I would like you to know that that the rest of these panelists and I, we, we do actually work together, even though we're across the country. We we have um, we're not all just reinventing the wheel in different places at the same time. We do actually collaborate. So it's really great to, to be here and I can learn some more from everybody hopefully today. Um, my journey through sport is uh, long and confusing, but it started off with ballet when I was three. Um, I was getting dragged along to my sister's ballet lessons and would not sit still. And so the teacher just let me join. <laughs> so that was, that was my life then until I was about 18. Uh, went to UVic, ended up getting into rowing, but I'm short and weak, so of course I was a cox. Um, ended up having to quit that because I started having grand mal seizures. It's funny what exhaustion will do to you. Um, so I had to quit that. And then I moved to Wales and Britain and uh, was with a, a cyclist. And so I somehow ended up working for British Cycling as a, as a sport physiologist. And then back to Canada, working as an IST manager for Cycling Canada. And yeah, it's long and convoluted. I still dance sometimes terribly, but I love it. That's why I do it. I love it. And why am I still in sport? It's because I really want to help fix it for the people who are struggling. And I've seen athletes on the very same team one has an amazing experience with no road bumps and the other one ends up quite literally suicidal um, and i also bring the lens of being a support staff member and knowing what goes on behind closed doors when the athletes aren't present is often even worse and so bringing bringing that lens to things yeah thank you thanks for that authentic statement too you know a fix it let's fix it for those <laughs> who are struggling Absolutely. Legacy and stewardship, right? Same as Elena. Right on. Thank you. Next. Go ahead, Megan. Thank you. Hey there, everyone. Uh, Megan Foster here. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm joining you from the prairies from Treaty 2 territory. And uh, again, I echo what, what Alana and Andrea said about thanking you for all joining as and to Jennifer for extending the invitation. This is a really great panel to be part of, and I'm already writing notes, and I'm supposed to be the one sharing things, so I can tell this is off to a good start. Um, so I started my uh, sporting career in Surus, Manitoba, which is the home of the longest suspension swinging bridge, historical suspension swinging bridge. Um, so if you are looking for a hot tourist destination, please join the town of 1,500 people in Surus, Manitoba. And you found me at the rink. Uh, I was a figure skater. And then in the off season, I was a baseball, softball, uh, volleyball. I was what you call a multi-sport athlete before multi-sport athlete was cool. Um, and I was one that was a, a jack of all trades because we needed to field teams. So if you were sport-ish, you participated in everything to make sure that the team, the team happened and that the, the others could participate as well. So I carry that through what I do now, and I really try to involve myself in a lot of things and do my best to involve my children as, in a lot of things as well. 
Um, and I was a very good uh, grassroots athlete. I like to say that my career peaked as a double uh, A. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Walter. Um, a double A provincial volleyball champion, 2003. Our banner is still hanging in service. Um, and that's where my, my athletic ambition really, really peaked, as I say. As a coach, I found much more success um, with Western Canadian champions and, and that sort of thing through synchronized skating primarily. So if you're not familiar with that, it's like synchronized swimming, but on ice. Um, and uh, so I really found my niche in team sport as a coach, uh, is where I, where I love to play. That then has carried me through into my professional career. And I like to say that I'm um, not a individual leadership coach or anything like that, but I am still that team coach. So I work with your full organization, your full department, um, all levels of stakeholders to figure out how we can solve the problem um, in a, from a group setting, group, group perspective. I liked your follow-up question, Jennifer, why do we stay in sport? And this is really uh, thought provoking for me. So in the last couple of minutes, I've been reflecting. I'm sure I'll have a different answer tomorrow. Today, currently, um, I started actually in sport, like sort of transitioned through university into coaching. And in figure skating, it is a paid position. We are we are paid at the, the grassroots level as well. And I could, my mind was blown that we could be paid to do something that we love. It wasn't, as uh, my colleague Kylo likes to say, we're not breaking the bank on the payments in sport, as we all know here, but we are getting paid and earning money for something that we love. So that's what started. Why I'm still here, I think much like Andrea, is that as I got deeper into, into sport, learning about different sports, different cultures, not everybody had that fantastic experience that I did. And that really uh, didn't sit well with me. So that's that's where I'm moving and, and keep working with sport and staying involved to really try to optimize the experience for everyone and not just, just those that happen to have the right circumstances to create a, a positive experience, but try to broaden that circumstance for everybody. Thanks so much, Megan. And uh, and feel free to post comments in the chat if something strikes you uh, or you have something to share as well or you'd like to share an answer to the same question of why do you stick with sport? Some people are abandoning it. What is keeping you engaged? Thank you. And Jeff, go for it. Uh, hi. Yeah, good morning. Thanks again, Jennifer. It's wonderful to see you again and to join the group for, a, I think, a really important discussion. Um, I probably share a lot of experiences with uh, my colleagues up here. Uh, the only thing I was going to say about service, though, is it still the case that you are an honorary citizen of service if you cross that suspension bridge? Only if you've ridden your bike across it. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> it's a, Yeah, I, I have been across, but on foot. Um, yeah, so I mean, my path into sport was, I think, somewhat common. I a little bit like Megan. I did everything as a young boy. I can't remember a time where I wasn't playing a sport and loving it. I would have said that my uh, sport experiences were almost universally positive. Uh, I was a my big sport in high school was a bat was basketball. I thought I was going to be a university basketball player. Then I went to Japan for a year and I came back and I wasn't very good at basketball anymore. And so I was kind of casting around for a sport at that point. And uh, that would have been the summer of 96 uh, Canadian rowers, as you may remember, did quite well in Atlanta that summer. So of course the Winnipeg rowing club has a come try rowing piece. And there were 50 of us university kids down on the tarmac at, 5 30 in the morning which i don't know would happen anywhere else and i only ended up sticking with it because the the social atmosphere was was so wonderful and met a fantastic group of people a number of whom i i still am in contact with today uh i would have said that my first uh profoundly negative experience in sport was at the olympics and uh we had a very for several of us a really crushing uh, performance there. Uh, there's, you know, there's a reason why we were 2002 and 2003 world champions, but only Olympians, right? Um, and as I moved from there into more sort of leadership in sport, whether it was coaching or administration, a lot of my motivation at that point was, 
I would want to do anything I possibly could to ensure that others didn't experience that piece. And of course, as I moved into more of those roles, I think a little bit like Andrea, you, you know, you peel back the, the layers a bit and you see more of how the sausage is made. And there are more, there are more disappointments in sports than simply not winning a race you really wanted to win, right? Um, and so that has become a bigger and bigger part of what I do and why I do it. And then I think like, like others on the call, I now have kids of my own who are participating in sport or in high level dance and uh, helping them navigate it, especially helping a daughter navigate sport has been interesting, but it's also now the worm has turned and it's full circle and it's just the joy of getting out and participating and running around and being with your friends and all that piece, which has been wonderful to, to be around again. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And, and yes, I am hearing a common thread of, of caring for those who are coming into sport, wanting to make sure that they have almost 100% positive experiences. You know, there's always going to be disappointments, but it's, I think we're talking about something more, more crushing, more painful, more harmful when we're talking about those negative experiences, um, adversity and challenge and, and, you know, losing or disappointments or lo losses in different ways are part of sports, what makes it exciting and great. But uh, it's these other aspects that, that really contradict the values of sport that we're trying to prevent. So uh, I've asked all of our panelists to think about some of the situations, uh, cases that they've experienced, examples, stories that they have that they could share of these excellent sport experiences. I find it's very powerful, of course, to learn from story, to learn from cases, uh, because then we can, we can relate as human beings. We can often find parallels with our experiences, but we can also then pull that apart and try to distill some of the elements that are at play because uh, again, as a group, we're trying to learn and identify what these things are that we can then carry forward or ensure exist within these environments uh, to, to yeah, create that legacy and create an environment that's, that's truly what it should be. You know, for instance, I was walking with my buddy this morning. She's a colleague, Tannis Farish, and a professor as well, but on to comment with Lulu right now doing some research and development, which is cool, that she was talking about entering at 52 years old for the very first time, an ultra uh, running race, a 50K race. So who would just sort of sign up for that? I mean, she's a runner, but, you know, as she said, no more than 10K ever. And But she signs up. She said, well, you know, I just figured I, I wanted to experience it. I'm going to be working with these people, so I should try it out. Her goals and her success indicators were that she finished tons of learning, tons of self-discovery, community, experienced the community of that community of ultra running, and, uh, and just the, the general experience itself, it was so rich and whole and, and fulfilling. And she came away just, you know, a, a renewed person. And I then went to the rowing course to get my row in and bumped into my buddy, Ken Cozell, Jeff will know him. And he talked about a race that they just partaken, taken part in uh, here in Victoria. I said, how'd it go? You had two guys, eights, one older guys, one younger guys. How'd it go? He goes, awesome. Close race. Both teams won, one get because of a handicap, the other one actually on raw time, followed by tomfoolery, he called it, beers, laughs, and the experience as a whole. It just made me completely feel like we're on the right track today, you know, that they've identified these indicators, these metrics of success. Neither of them talked about winning necessarily uh, as being the ultimate goal. They were more talking about that general experiences and all these different elements that made it so powerful. And I haven't seen Kenny smile in a while, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> so I know you all have cases, examples, stories, projects that you're working on. I'd love to kick off by hearing from each of you. What does excellence in sport look like? And then from there, I'll invite all the participants to chime in with, with their questions, comments, and uh, all of us work together to pull out those salient elements that are emerging from these stories, these scenarios that we can then work on building into sport uh, that will ensure positive experiences for all going forward. Is there anybody who'd like to start? Can't be Alana. Let's start with Jeff maybe because 
Yeah, well, just given your strategy seemed pretty sound now. Um, yeah, so I mean, Jen asked us to prepare a few um, thoughts or stories here, and I guess I kind of wind back right to the beginning of our path down kind of discussing safe sports, um, the EDIA, uh, workplace culture, all of these things. And it really grew out of, many of you on the call will remember a number of years ago where the Canadian Olympic Committee had quite a, uh, pick, your, pick your descriptive word, but a real challenge with the, their leadership uh, and the kind of workplace environment that was was happening day to day and you know quite frankly was probably about as open as a secret as could have been in sport and so we ended up having what was i guess for me but uh, i think for a number of others a fairly open a uh, little bit uncomfortable conversation about what people's experiences were in this realm and uh, i hesitate for this next part because i just listened to a great podcast by michael lewitz and it's all about he's got a series of them on experts and one of the first ones is like men explaining things and why they think they should be doing that stuff. But um, so I'm not, I'm not, this is my own voyage of discovery. This is not news to at least half of you probably, but I was, I was certainly aware that women experienced harassment in the workplace. What I was not prepared for out of that conversation was the frequency and the impact of someone telling a story versus reading something in Harvard Business Review about its prevalence, right? So that was, you know, just on a personal journey, that was a very powerful conversation. But it really was great because it allowed us to kick off and have a number of other very difficult conversations, right? About uh, stories of abuse and harassment in sport, uh, how we, conduct ourselves or how we work with athletes when they are working through a, uh, a case. Uh, it's guided some of our discussions on what it, um, what it means to be representative or inclusive or how we think about uh, being a welcoming place for the whole person. And I think our, where we have got to with it, now this is after a number of years and a number of speakers and a number of case studies, right? So here's a story in the news. Let's have a bit of a staff meeting time dedicated to what would happen if this occurred in our environment? Are we protected? How would we conduct ourselves if it turned out? What if this happened in a partner organization? How would we respond? And I think where we've got to and what I'm extremely proud of with our group is uh, a staff that has a fluency and a comfort in this language. And I think we can talk about this later, but I'm concerned that so much of what we do in this space is a little bit performative and a little bit box ticking. And it's very much one thing to have the speaker come in, teach us the terminology, give us some facts and figures. It's a very different question if the people on your team can go out and use that in a diagnostic fashion, in a supportive fashion, interact with the people they interact with, uh, and have a real comfort level. And I think that more than anything, I think that is the kind of thing that allows us to talk about preventative steps, right? Where we can have very real conversations. And I, I was struck by way of contrast is um, it was a couple of years ago, we had, there was a student in my daughter's class who made quite an overt threat to her. And so obviously parents were concerned. We you know, get passed on to the fellow who was the principal of the school and began talking to him, it became very, very clear very quickly that he'd written out two sentences from the student or the school's policy manual and was only able to repeat those back to us. And it just, it was, it was not a remotely productive conversation. I got no sense that he understood um, any nuance to the discussion or any of this. And I, I think by way of contrast, I think we see a little bit of that today is that we, we have not exercised systemically this muscle of how do we talk about these things? How do we consider gray? This example is not exactly what they taught me in the course. How am I going to go about navigating it? So that has been our approach. Um, I think we've got a well-worked muscle. Thankfully, we haven't 
had to uh, exercise it in our immediate team, but we do find ourselves sort of sitting next to athletes as they navigate a not always very helpful, uh, safe sport investigative and, and um, uh, resolution process. So that's where we're at. There's a ton of stuff that we could also talk about, but appreciate there's probably three other wonderful stories here, but that's, that's sort of how we got to where we are. You're just muted there, Jen. Yeah. I'm glad right. I was. Sorry, I was typing and I never mute myself. So I'm on, I'm very bad at unmuting. Imagine after two years of Zoom. But I, I love what you're saying. These these words that I'm grabbing onto, like exercising the actual muscle. In at Railroads, we talk about uh, application and theory. You've got to teach theory, but you got to pick up that tool and make it work in your hand. And that takes practice, exploration, kind of a, a vulnerability as well to just try it out. It's just like sport, learning something new. And then the problem with performative versus actual um, capacity and skill in that area. And it takes practice again, learn truth in sport, learn from sport, right? It's just like it, just like it works in sport. Thank you. Who'd like to go next? And we can dig into, I hope you're, you'll share some of the examples that you've experienced as well that have demonstrated that muscle for you. Okay. Who'd like to share? Go ahead, Megan. Yeah, I'll just jump in actually a few things that Jeff said, um, that prompted my thought as well is that, um, being uncomfortable doesn't necessarily mean unsafe if you've built that 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 culture and that trust within your team. And I know Jeff and the CSCM has been working hard to to build that. And that's something that came to uh, to me through the Royal uh, sorry um, Royal Roads. I was looking at your your tagline there through the Rainbow Resource Center in Winnipeg. Um, one of their facilitators mentioned that that first building that atmosphere that that we can make mistakes and that it's okay to be trying to work that muscle and mix up someone's pronouns by accident or you know using a term that that may be offensive to some and then be willing to hear and listen to why it is offensive and it's and it's okay to learn and grow based from an error that you make um, and I think a lot of people are really, they want to do well and want to say the right thing, but are afraid to. And so don't get that chance to practice in that safe atmosphere. And that's what, um, what we try to do with, with the clients we work with is work to find out where cultures are currently, where is your organization, how well are you living those values? And then what recommendations would you have or what suggestions to improve living those values? And that's something I picked up through my time at, uh, at Royal Roads as a student is really applying the behavior and the action to the value. And what does that mean? And, and really going deeper to take that value from a piece of paper or from a frame on the wall into everyday action for everyone within that organization, whether it's an athlete or a coach or a volunteer or, you know, the person who takes registrations behind the desk. How do they what are their behaviors that reflect those values? And that can help to, to build that atmosphere from where people, people work. Um, I will say on a, a personal example, before I jump into my, my example of, of working with clients uh, and experiences, I work in a very um, uh, energetic and, and right now safe sport is, as we all know, it's top of mind, it's in the news, it's in the culture, people are reaching out and asking, what does this mean? We want to do better, we want gender equity, we want reconciliation, it's very, um, very, uh, I don't want to get into political terms, but often a certain political side of the spectrum. My partner, Justin, works in the opposite end. He works in an industry that is very, uh, very traditional, very conservative. And so he and I realized that we were being a little bit snippy with one another the last couple of months. And I'm not sure if that's due to COVID or just who knows why. However, uh, what we realized was we would try to have an adult conversation after our children went to bed. And we found each other really battling one another. And, and it, was, it was not a open, it was, well, what about this? And what about this? And what we were doing was coming from our very opposite ends of, of our days. and not taking the time to listen and, and just assuming that we were being challenged and that our ideas were being challenged. And I say that because we have then started to actively, okay, barriers down, barriers down, barriers down. I just was going to have a conversation with you about what happened today, or I just wanted to share with you something and I'm not looking to, to argue or fight. And I think depending on the culture of some organizations, people aren't coming to the table from very different perspectives to discuss and people are feeling defensive and they're feeling 
polarized, and that then puts up those walls and those barriers and prevents any sort of change or reflection. So we are, even at, at a personal level, we're experiencing that. Yeah, great insight, Megan. I think, uh, I think it's exactly what's motivated this webinar, that I feel like we are caught in this polarization. People are choosing sides, which is unproductive. We're very defensive. There is this kind of antagonism, and it's not actually solving a problem, which is how do we help sport be all that it can be? Yeah. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Andrea, she's getting me. You pointed at me. Elena brought that last. Elena, I want to know what you're going to say. Anyway, um, I I have I have a couple of potential really positive environments when I think about that, and one of them was in sport, but the one that really springs to mind off the top of my head is my kids' daycare. Um, they went to a daycare that was. Um, basically in an old school building they had two classrooms so like 35 little kids uh two and a half to five and then there was a separate building where the the baby room was and the toddlers and you'd walk into this building and you would hear happy sounds and i used to ask the head teacher all the time how do you do that i only have two of them at home and i can't like they're constantly fighting and it's like well, how do you keep 35 little people happy um so it was this really positive environment. And then my daughter went to elementary school and had a horrendous time. She was bullied the whole way through from kindergarten through to grade seven. And similar to your, your child, Jeff, we went to the principal and in kindergarten, we were given an eight page handout on how to teach her how to be a better victim. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thanks. So then I started thinking about why, why are we teaching athletes how to be resilient? when actually their environment is the problem. We're just telling them to gaslight themselves into thinking that things are okay because you're tough enough and you're high performance. Um, so yeah, that, that, that sparked that memory for me, Jeff. Um, but the daycare, my daughter went in and actually interviewed the, the head teacher about how they create this positive environment because she was trying to come up with an anti-bullying program in high school. Um, and it came down to everybody that worked there understanding that it was part of their job to help people interact that was actually one of their key priorities and so they would intervene when they saw something starting to brew they didn't wait until it exploded they would get in there early you know i see you all want to play with the same toy what could you do well we could share it or we could take turns or i could find another toy right and that they would they would intervene early if somebody was really getting worked up they would use that lovely bystander uh, intervention tool of distraction and they would ask the worked up person to come and help them garden for a minute and then just chat with them and calm them down but it was part of their job to help these kids learn how to interact and that was what I saw was missing at school. The, the teachers right from kindergarten on said, that's not my job. I'm here to teach them to read. That's not my job. And I'm hearing that in sport as well, from coaches, from administrators, from everybody, club presidents. Oh, it's not my job to intervene when there's bullying happening. Of course, I'm aware of it. It's been going on for years. It's not, it's not my role. And so um, that really struck me the other day I was watching there, there's a new free 23 minute uh, commit to kids video. It's a, a introduction to child protection. And I was watching it so that I could recommend it to people, which I do, and I'll post the link later. Um, it's free, you should do it. It's fabulous. It's not traumatic. It's not all the big, bad, and the ugly. It's, it's really um, an explanation of what people go through when they're groomed and uh, why people don't report right away what was going on. And near the end, there's a bit where, where the woman's talking about how we only know about maltreatment after somebody reports it, right? And sometimes that takes years and sometimes it takes decades. And even the people around them were groomed, right? Everybody thought it was okay, or they, they were um, jealous of the attention that this person was getting, right? Mm -hmm. The only way we can prevent abuse and maltreatment is by having everybody know that it's their responsibility to intervene early. So same as at the daycare, 
right? You intervene when you start to see something brewing and everybody has to, because that's when you can prevent it. That is the only time you can prevent it. If you let it get past that, the abuse has already happened. And yes, we need good reporting mechanisms and policies for when things go wrong, but it, collectively, we need to look after each other and be responsible for each other and speak up. And so that's a big part of the work that I'm doing this year. And one of the best examples I've seen of that um, was actually at the Vancouver Circus School. My kids started doing trampoline and silks because they loved it. It was so fun, right? Uh, and the guy who was running the, the company, a guy called Travis Johnson, um, is probably one of the best coaches I've ever seen. Um, he happened to be teaching my son trampoline and my son just had a moment where he, um, he was just suddenly scared to, to go onto his back, to land on his back on the trampoline. And instead of saying, no, 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 you can do it, keep trying. Travis said, oh, that's totally normal. That happens all the time. Even like professional circus performers, sometimes you just get a thing and you just can't do it. So why don't we work on something else? Is that okay with you? Oh, like the relief. <laughs> and then just chatting with him another day, he happened to mention that he banned a parent from the school. They weren't allowed in the facility because they'd been body shaming somebody else's kid. And he said, that's not okay. There's your warning if you do it again, you're out. Your kid is welcome to keep coming, but you can't come in the building with them. That's not all right. And everybody knew that this was going on. And so that was the culture that you walked into. It didn't matter if you were a six-year-old coming to do trampoline because it was fun and you wanted to do front flips because they're cool. Uh, it, was, it was the same for everybody. And it was this um, the application of consent in coaching, not as can I touch you here, although that was there as well, but do you actually consent to try this thing? I think you can do it, but do you feel like you can do it? And if you don't, I'm not gonna force you. Um, so similar to, it always makes me think of Simone Biles and what a great example she was for just having the, the nerve to say, I'm not safe. This isn't safe, I can't do this, I'm not doing this. And that the, the Olympics is an opportunity to, to you know, to perform and to, to, to show the world what you can do. And if you're not in the right headspace or you're not physically able to do that, you, of course you should be able to say, nope, sorry, today's not the day, right? So I think, I think there's some great examples out there and, and yes, I will, I will post the, the link because it's, it's 23 minutes, it's just a video, you can do a quiz after whatever, but it's such great content that Commit to Kids stuff. And, and check out the rest of their website while I've got you. They have a Kids in the Know program that is astonishingly good. Free videos for, for young people. Um, they have the Cyber Tips program. If you've never heard of it, it's where you can report sextortion. And they even have something called Project Arachnid, which is a web crawler that if you have had um, intimate images of yourself shared, you can submit them to this thing without anybody having to see them. And it will constantly crawl the web and um, put up requests to have those images taken down if it comes across them. So amazing tools, especially for teens at the moment. So check out their whole website. Okay, I'll Thank stop, Elena. <laughs> Thanks so much. And we'll make sure we put it on our website as well so it endures. And for those who watch later, we'll get the, uh, the link that way. Thank you, great. And I like how you actually tied right back to your uh, point about teaching people to be a better victim or be resilient. I've always struggled with the word resilient. We talk more about thriving. You can't thrive unless the environment allows you to thrive. So, and that links us back to true leadership in sport. Whose responsibility is, is it to create these environments? Guess what? The sport leaders and whether it's coaches or other leaders within the environment, um, focusing on that environment. I've also heard threads from all of you around culture and culture really is just live your values. Are we enacting, are we ex exercising the actual muscle or just performing? Are we actually doing our values? And we think of values as very soft or like soft skills, but they're core, they're core, they're central and they are not soft or fuzzy. They're absolutely essential to everything. It's what we, what we believe in, what's motivating, engaging us. So values are, are central. Um, I'm also hearing this idea of responsibility and I've often thought of sport leadership coaching in, in sport is probably one of the most important roles you'll play in the world because 
not only are you caring for someone's physical self, but their mental, their emotional, their spiritual, they're, you know, they're so vulnerable because of their passion. And here you are responsible for helping them achieve their, their dreams. And I think it's just one of the most important roles that you can play. Um, and it, it's interesting. It's often a volunteer job, right? But again, because we love it so much. Um, and that leads in, of course, we'll hear from Alana as well, but I want to highlight a guest here. We've got Al Morrow on the line and Al was our, our coach from way back in the nineties. And uh, I'm, I'm just hearing so many of the elements he taught us about the importance of having clear values, taking responsibility as a coach to ensure that your athletes are living those values, being respectful, having perspective, uh, treating each other well, and yes, intervening if people are not um, uh, interacting in a productive manner, uh, but also ensuring that the environment was safe and excellent so we could focus on our, on our goals and do our best. Uh, love the, the shout out to Simone Biles as well. People like that who are really demonstrating leadership. They're really the, the tough people, right? They're making these very strong, hard, difficult decisions, uh, but also demonstrating such great leadership in the process. It's not about suffering through, but, but actually stepping up. Thank you. Now, Alana, can you tell us um, your, your, and we'll have more examples, I'm sure, but share whatever you want. Take your time. Sure. I don't know if it's, I, maybe I missed that one. I shouldn't have gone last with uh, listening to some amazing stories from my colleagues here. Um, Jennifer, one of the stories, this wasn't in my notes and I, I made notes so that I don't go off track, but you did mention something about running an ultra marathon. And I signed up for a marathon maybe 14, 15 years ago and it ended up being an ultra marathon um, because at the halfway mark, I started running the wrong way for I don't know how long. Um, I do know that my children and my then husband left, so they weren't at the finish line, but I did make it um, in a time that was not what I had been training for um, to the finish line. And so when I think about my own pers personal success in the one marathon um, ultra, that is, that I did run, I think about completing that. I was running with some stress fractures at the time and eight kilometers left of bloody nose. So not only did I make it through adversity and the bloody nose and the stress fractures, but I also, it was in PEI. So I got the double scoop cow's ice cream. So that's my personal measures of success. And it, you, I, it was not included in my notes, but that uh, I had to share that story, but because, you know, cow's ice cream. Um, so we do, uh, and I've had the benefit of working with Megan, um, doing a little bit of work with Andrea as well. And we do a lot of work um, out East right now with our athletes. And we've talked a lot and we've heard a lot in the safe sport world um, and in just sport in general, about listening to athletes. And I think the last year or two years of my work in particular, learning and listening and giving athletes a voice at the provincial varsity level has been absolutely sort of almost more important than anything that I certainly have done and will shape a lot of what I'm doing. So a couple of the anecdotes that I'm gonna share here, talk a lot about the work that we have with athletes. So one of the projects that I'm involved with, and I think you mentioned it, is uh, the Restorative Justice Project. And we're looking at a restorative approach to sport. And so for those of you that are interested, stay tuned because there will be more coming. Mm -hmm. But through that, it's in its infancy right now, but we are engaging with different stakeholders. And the first stakeholder group that we engage with was a number of athletes in our province in Nova Scotia. And one of the open-ended questions as, as we gave the presentation about restorative justice and a restorative approach to sport was they were asked, and we talk about culture, you, you mentioned that a little bit, Jennifer, but we, when asked what they want to see change about sport, one varsity athlete um, by traditional measures of success, you know, had the varsity athlete was on a winning team and so forth, unprompted, and I, I, I'm quoting him here, said, can we start thinking about new ways of defining winning? And I just, it just, the room, I mean, the Zoom room, I guess, went silent. And so that from a varsity, a successful varsity athlete was just absolutely instrumental. And I think that will carry us through this restorative project uh, that we're doing. A couple other anecdotes that I have um, from, again, this is primarily working with athletes. And I think it goes back to my initial comments about legacy and creating these experiences in these voices so that we can work with the next generation and help the next generation. Um, I'm working with a pro bono law student 
um, who recently uh, is helping us. We're, we're about to release a series of mental health podcasts. So thank you, Andrea, for, for talking about mental health as an aspect of safe sport. And I can talk about that or share that. Uh, they should be released within the next week. And they were created by athletes um, and they are for athletes and they're created by athletes who, again, are not necessarily Olympians, but they are sort of that varsity that whether it's varsity university or varsity high school, provincial team, Canada games and so forth. And one of the students that I'm working with said, I finally realized that I'm at a place where I can recognize that my worth and my identity, my value is more than a spot in the boat or a place that I scored on a fitness test. So again, these are, these are the comments coming from athletes that are instructing some of the work that we're doing. Um, you, some people on this call, I recognize some names um, that I've seen are know about uh, the Nova Scotia True Sport Athlete Ambassador Program. Uh, it's a long acronym, but we're working with True Sport. And as you know, and, and Jennifer, this goes back to the values that you were talking about and the values. This is a values based program that marries or tries to marry safe sport with true sport. And we've almost completed our first year of this program. Um, and we've had some incredible experiences, some incredible athletes that have come through this program. And most recently, in fact, two days ago, um, one of the athletes reached out to me and said, I know my time as an athlete ambassador is coming up, but what else can I do? How else can I be involved? And I thought with this on the heels, that's winning, that's success that we have created this, they have this voice, they have this passion to continue to give back to their communities, to give back to their sporting world. So those are my anecdotes. Uh, the first few that I've, I've written down, but I'll give the space to somebody else. Jennifer, do you mind if I just jump in there? Um, a few things that Elena mentioned made me think back to what Jeff said about his experience in realizing the prevalence of, um, of sexism in the workplace. And I'm paraphrasing, that's not exactly what Jeff said, but uh, that's what, what we found with, with athletes. And that's often what we hear when we work with clients and, and organizations is that we have an athlete rep. And so that's that checkbox we have. Yep, we've got an athlete rep on our board or yep, we have, we heard from one athlete. And while yes, that is certainly important, what that isn't doing is, is capturing the prevalence of issues beyond one person's experience. And so with working with Elena in Nova Scotia and, and the wonderful team out East is, is bringing the athletes together to hear their voices and to hear from, from one another and to, to uh, capture that discussion, to then bring it back to, to the, the leaders in the space to see what, what can be done. And, and I know there's, Elena's mentioned just the tip of the iceberg of what's um, the great things that have come from that. But I think that's something that, that we can experience or that we can learn from athletes' experiences is that uh, re redefining or that that desire to redefine what winning means and this came up with an entirely different client that I was working with and uh, their athletes were um, there were some Olympians there were some world medalists there were some next gen development team athletes and almost all of them talked about the desire to want to go to school and to complete degrees or to work uh, you know to to still participate in sport and go to school and this was the age of athlete that they were that was that was a choice they were having to make, which was really unfortunate for them. And so this organization, that is now what they are defining rather than medal count and funding and that sort of thing. They're now looking at, okay, how many athletes completed a degree while we were working with them? How many athletes went from high school to post-secondary of their choice, whether it was degree, diploma, certificate program, um, and how can we support that? So it's it's really looking at different metrics. And this is a, a theme that's come up again too, but different metrics for that, that in, holistic well-being beyond just simply medal count or uh, or champions. Uh, thank you. Great uh, piggybacking and keep going. We'll get to you in a second there, Andrew. I just want to highlight that uh, Siobhan Williamson is highlighting Kath Bishop, who's been on this webinar. So a uh, good buddy and has written a wonderful book that really talks. And I love the long win. I think that's part of what is winning. And she talks about, you know, it being like a legacy, something that endures, right, keeps going. How else do we want to keep thinking about what, what does winning in sport mean or achieving some sort of successful, positive, excellent experience in sport? Jeff has his hand up, and then I'll go to Andrea with another story. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jen. Uh, I was just building off of Megan's comments. She started to reference the things we might measure uh to to determine success the other one that i i would love 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 to see more 
uh, clubs and kids based programs do more of is um, evaluate your coaches on the basis of the share of their kids that sign up next year. Right. So are they, are they pulling on mom and dad's sleeve saying, you know, soccer was great last year. When's registration again. And I think that you would find very quickly um, where your quality coaches at the development level are. And I, I say that, and I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Andrew, Andrew, I think it was you that would mention just sort of the environment at your kids' daycare. Um, so our older daughter, is, is a, she's a quite a strong student, but I remember back in the daycare, back in the early years, education bit, she had these teachers that just made her want to be there. And it sort of struck me that in that environment, she couldn't help but learn, right? She wants to show up and hear what they have to say. And lo and behold, the, the, the student follows. And I think the same thing with sport, right? If, if kids want to go up, want to hear what the coach has to say, they can't help but learn, right? Mm -hmm. And I, that, that, I have to believe that's a relatively easy thing to measure and track for organizations that don't always have tons and tons of capacity. And, and that's really that we, you know, we're throwing this term around of psychological safety, but we want to take the, I want to take this opportunity to unpack what that is, right? So Tim Clark's done a great, great job of creating these four dimensions of psychological safety that are easy to talk about. And, and I think easy to measure and also easy to then facilitate it's safe to be themselves, show up and be accepted and be cool to be you. Uh, you don't have to change anything. You don't have to wear certain gear or the right socks in the basketball court. <laughs> you know, you just show up and with whatever you got. So how do we know they're accepted, welcome, included for who they are? And then next, once they have that, that foundation, now I'm safe to uh, contribute. Now I feel free to learn. I can try something You take, make a mistake. I can show you what I got, you know, on the court. And then they're safe to um, actually learn. So contribute, give who you are, and then learn, try those new things. But the biggest one, I think, or the one that we're kind of working toward, we, I don't think we really have done a very good job of, is safe to challenge. You know, I just had a great story from my buddy of a young athlete that very dicey coach that I warned the coach about was invited into the environment. And this athlete took it on and spoke up when, when he saw things that were off the rails, that were undermining, that were insidious, that were um, antagonistic, that were unsafe, right? But he felt safe to challenge. Why? Because the head coach had created that culture. He calls it radical candor and well done, right? So there's this kid feeling safe to actually challenge what he saw, having a bit of language uh, around it as well. Love it. Thank you. Andrea has another story. Uh, well, I wanted to pick up on Nicole's comment, but also this idea of measuring retention. We keep, of course, athlete retention, but my experience in a, in a well-documented toxic sport, British cycling, if you look at the photo of each Olympic team and count the number of staff members that are the same, it's hardly any. And the two or three that are still there well, other than mechanic, I don't know, man, mechanics just stick around. Uh, the senior leadership, that to me is a sign of toxic leadership. If those two leaders are still there, quadrennial after quadrennial, and everybody else is different, there's a reason. So yes, for athlete retention, but athletes move on because they age out or they move or they go to university or whatever happens. If your staff aren't able to stay, there's something funky going on. Um, so yeah, that, that needs to be another metric. And I don't understand why we don't ask the athletes to report to own the podium. Why are the annual reviews only written by senior leadership? Why is there no connection farther down the tree? The athletes have no input. They don't even know what goes into those things. I know because I wrote them for 10 years for Cycling Canada, right? Like why is there no questionnaire or survey or anything sent out to the actual athletes to say, hey, we need to know how things actually are for you. <laughs> Without that accountability, they think they're getting all the information and then they find out later that that's not at all what was going on. Anyway, um, Nicole, I love your, your comment here about um, people having defi different definitions of what's okay and what's not okay. And so I can share with you one of the one of the big pieces of my work right now is developing a tool. Um, it'll 
work on your phone. You can use it anywhere. Uh, and it's six simple objective questions to determine whether a behavior was okay or not. And it's important to remember that it's the behavior that's being assessed, not the person. And then the idea is, you know, there are some situations where yes, you need to make a formal report, but those are pretty serious and they're pretty few and far between. Most of this is actually athlete to athlete bullying or, or violence. Um, some of it is, is between support staff. It could be between a board member and a CEO. The, the standards are the same. These same six questions apply. And it'll, it'll give you an idea of, you know, is it a yellow flag? Is it a red flag? What do you do about it? Somebody else said, not everybody's good at having these difficult conversations. So we'll be providing resources on how to do that as well. How to intervene if you need to. And if you can't, because it's not safe, what else can you do? You know, you can still document what's going on just because you're not safe to step in and say something in the moment. So hopefully we'll have a tool, um, a simple tool to help everybody have a common understanding at all levels of sport of like, actually that wasn't consensual or it wasn't voluntary. Maybe they said yes, but they didn't actually mean it because you coerced them into it or it's not developmentally appropriate or it's not context appropriate, right? So all this stuff comes out of the child protection world. Um, because I think we have this, you know, universal code of conduct. I don't know how many of you have memorized it. <laughs> it's 15 pages long. I look at the thing every couple of days, the BC one, it's 12 pages. Like, I'm sorry, you can't promote that. Nobody, you can, I've never seen a successful ad campaign for a code of conduct, but maybe this is something that, that we can get behind to, to help clarify it for people. And so you can have a conversation that says, you know, I noticed that, that um, when you said such and such to this athlete, maybe you didn't get the response that you were hoping for. Maybe it didn't motivate them the way that you were hoping. Um, you know, can we, can we look at that according to these criteria? And, and, you know, how could you improve that for next time? Outstanding. And I have a hand up but to build on and kind of summarize Andrea's concepts too of the simple, a simple language and, and tools and how do we reduce the UCCMS into something that's a little more accessible or useful. That's some great steps that we can take. Uh, there are some great tools out there that we can highlight as well. The governance piece is coming up that we can come back to. But then I also want to highlight retention and then unpacking retention so that it's not just retention, but our metrics are, are a little more nuanced and we know how to investigate or explore retention, but that it's worth looking at, right? What's bringing people back and or why not and teasing those apart so we're really informed and that can be definitely part of the annual review that the whole community participates in. It definitely shouldn't just be something, again, box ticking by the board when they, uh, they don't know. We did, we had Rose Mercy on recently too, while you saw the first slide, sport governance and she talks a bit about in the writings that she's done for CERC around how to how to you know evaluate a CEO as a board and and all the ways all the bits of information you can pull in it doesn't necessarily have to be a 360 typically but but that kind of a more comprehensive evaluation okay we've got Sharon at the BC sport branch with a question or comment go ahead um, hi there um, so I have very interesting discussion and in ones that we have every day um, I'm not to toot our own horn, but um, um, I will. <laughs> uh, we have an after school sport and an arts initiative that um, we think has been very um, successful in kind of building up that rapport amongst kids. I mean, this, this is a program that reaches the kids in, in um, the really dark corners, um, the kids that have bad days you know, every day. And one of the things that, um, you know, I, it, um, and, and I'm not trying to be a negative, <laughs> Nelly, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm trying, is, is just not really understanding um, capacity. And, you know, to give you an example, um, you know, we have schools or, or kids that there is, um, no one like for them to um, fill out a form to apply for grants for kids sport. Um, you know they need a parental signature or whatever. Some of these, you know, kids don't have you know 
that. And, um, you know, we're always asking, and we had a discussion uh, in a different meeting, um, you know, we, we are always asking them um, to have groups to have all these policies and, and bylaws and constitutions. Well, the, the reality is that, that um, you know, it's, um, it's just, you know, a, a group and a community organization that, that um, you know, doesn't have, you know, pieces of paper. <laughs> um, you know, they don't have that, that, uh, that policy and they can't translate any of the stuff that we're asking. And the only reason that they do have these bylaws and policies and constitution is so that they can apply for government funding, which is totally, um, <laughs> you know, uh, ridiculous, I think. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm just putting that out there that um, the challenges are a lot more, um, you know, different than like what we, what we uh, often sometimes, you know, forget. Sorry. Thank you, Sharon. And our next webinar actually is going to address that. And it's so ironic how all of these things inter intersect because here's Peter Baxter and his daughter. I'm hoping to have her on the next webinar talking about what we can do to better support uh, sport at the community level because again, resources are, are lacking and yet we expect so much of all our sport organizations. How can we, how can we do a better job of sharing resources equipping smaller you know, groups, clubs, volunteer organizations with the necessary uh, structure systems processes without expecting them to somehow magically create those or come up with, you know, how many boards do we have across Canada right now, right, at all the different levels of sport? Uh, and is there some redundancy that we could uh, eradicate uh, through sharing and, and more sustainable practices? So Sharon, may I'll be knocking on your door to get you involved in that next webinar, I think, too. Thank you. And uh, Peter's also highlighting another tool, another strategy of bringing people in who have great knowledge, uh, who are, yeah, Dana Sinclair, right? She knows how to assess and can support people in designing clear ways of, of determining or at least asking for the kind of people we want to invite into the, the environments, you know, and are they, are they clear that their role includes supporting interaction and leadership development of their athletes, et cetera, et cetera. And so all sorts of great resources across the world. And that's what this webinar is all about, is coalescing around those and collating them. All right, other, um, other things we want to talk about. I want to get, dig in a little more. We're really doing a great job of highlighting what are the elements we want to be fostering, supporting, looking for in these environments that we know contribute to a sport environment that's excellent, that's healthy, safe, inclusive, accessible, um, things like looking for a retention. And are these kids wanting to come back, be ambassadors and give back in different ways? Do people have a voice? Are they safe to challenge? Are we living like actually, um, you know, flexing the muscles of our values? Are we recognizing our, our responsibilities, but also recognizing where there are issues and when to intervene? Are we equipped with the language to intervene or call for or structure um, our hiring processes or our evaluation processes that, that really do foster the right kinds of behaviors, the behaviors that will, will support these kinds of values. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Jen, I'll try and go quick here. Um, just you referenced uh, inclusion in your, in your comments right there. And um, we had a really good conversation about this over the last month or so. Um, we had a young person, uh, Megan, I don't know if you've come across them, um, L'Arc en Ciel, it's a Winnipeg organization, Jay Champagne, came in and spoke to us on um, sort of current issues in LGB issues in sport. Um, wonderful conversations. Then our follow-up was, okay, what are we going to do with this? And how do we, uh, what actions do we take? And so one of them came, well, we should have some sort of visual representation of, look, this is a welcoming space and, you, you know, welcome to all comers. Okay, how do we do that, right? And so, you know, for the straight white guy, this concept of an intersectionality is pretty new, right? But we started talking about all of the different groups that we wanted to uh, recognize and it, it 
quickly became clear that we couldn't make an infographic for it, right? Um, but it just so happened, we, we did get a little travel in the summer. We were just wandering around London, England, and happened to stumble into this church. And I'll, I'll post it in here. It's, uh, it's not St. Paul's Cathedral, it's St. Paul's Church. And they have got a wonderful uh, two paragraph statement about who we welcome. And just the way it is written is so wonderful that even if you are not specifically identified, I have to believe that any reader would say they're talking about me. They welcome what, however I think about myself, they are, they are welcoming me, welcoming me into this space. And so now we try to take that and say, okay, well, it's, we're not a church. Let's, how, how can we modify that? But I just thought the, the language was so, uh, so welcoming, so inclusive and really conveyed the sentiment of how to do inclusion. So I'll, I'll pop it in here, but I'd really encourage people to look at it. I thought it was wonderful. And borrow it, <laughs> steal it, take it, use it, uh, customize it for your own uh, and, and with an acknowledgement, love it. What are some other artifacts that people have utilized to demonstrate welcome and inclusion? And I draw your attention to Nicole's recent statement here up in the chat about how do we make sure that you know, here we are, this Eurocentric group creating these statements. You know, how do we involve people in the making of the statements? That's an artifact in itself of living inclusive values. Okay, Andrea, you have some. Um, I've been having some fascinating conversations with Kristen Worley recently about approaching the design of sport and everything else um, as integration, so human-centered design. So you design a system or a building or an anything for everybody to begin with. And the difference that that makes from talking about inclusion, because when you talk about inclusion, it implies that somebody has the power to exclude or include, right? And so a great example of that is um, a colleague of mine here uh, is an official for uh, para sport and he was telling me how the the olympic and paralympic villages that are designed the games that are designed around the paralympic needs they work great for everybody the villages that are designed for the olympics and then they try and make them accessible for the paralympics are a gong show it just doesn't work so this idea of designing things for everybody and also um focusing on the well-being of athletes so that you're not harming anybody. If you start with that as your, as your point, then, then all of the other discussion is about helping people have good experiences in sport. And, and some of the, the gender fluidity and all of those other issues become secondary. Um, so that, you know, I, I found there's a great matrix, uh, what's it called, the well-being and performance matrix. So you've got your, your two little lines, right? So uh, well-being, high and low, performance, high and low. And, and people tend to think that you can either have high performance or well-being, and it's actually not true at all. If you, if you look at the sort of hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-actualization and high performance is the peak of the pyramid, it's not the base. If you don't have safety and, and physiological safety, you can't perform at your best, or maybe you can on occasion if you're one of those rare beings that has a seamless pathway through sport. But if you have high well-being and high performance, you're flourishing, right? That's great. That's awesome. That's where we want everybody to be. Whether you're, somebody said, you know, a six-year-old mini whatever the heck playing soccer, that's still high performance for you. If you're performing at your best, that's what we want. And what we have most of in our sports system is people who have high performance but low well-being. And they are distressed but functional. Right. If I think about a lot of the people I know in sport, not just athletes, staff, you know, going on six week training camps and leaving their little kids at home and the stresses of that, like they're, they're functioning. They're not functioning at their best. They're certainly not flourishing. And then we get these cases where, you know, then their performance starts to drop because it goes on for way too long and they're distressed and dysfunctional and that affects their whole life. So, you know, this idea that you have to choose between high performance and well-being is a myth. 
that we need to we need to bust. And you Sorry, mentioned my little rant. <laughs> yeah, and someone mentioned it earlier, the idea of um, resilience, oh, it might have been you, the resilience, you know, and being a better victim. And I think we do, we conflate pain with limits in sport. It, it's really about pushing through our limits. Lactic acid is a good example of that. And yeah, it can kind of burn and hurt, but it's really about limits. Um, and we, we get that a bit mixed up with then pain, which might include six weeks away from our children. That's painful. Well, some people might not think that, but, but, you know, I would. And so, you know, we're pushing through, we're being resilient, pushing through pain. Is that a limit? You know, so uh, love it. And this idea of it, these two things not being mutually exclusive, if anything, as Jeff was saying, it, it actually combines to allow you to really learn at your best and develop at your very best. Beautiful. What are some other, oh, first I wanted to build on the universal design as well. So we're talking about inclusion. And there's just a wonderful story, but also a wonderful man. You accidentally hit mute. Yep, thank you. At um, the University of Arizona. And he's, this is a beautiful video I, I encourage anyone to watch. But Derek Brown is really great to learn a little bit more about as well. And he talks about how he wants every kid. He, he has a para program, which doesn't happen much at universities but how every kid should have the same experience, not just an experience that is comparable. So if his para athlete is going to graduate, they shouldn't have to come around the back and up a ramp. They should have exactly the same experience as someone else who's heading up those stairs, shaking the hand of the president and the chancellor and moving across the stage. Love it. And, and if we can wrap our heads around that universal design that, that meets everyone's needs and Para just has so much to teach us. Hey, para sport as well. Love it. What are some of the other, the structures, systems, processes that we're looking for in sport? And I encourage participants to weigh in here too. We have eight minutes together uh, through the chat or turn your mic on. I'll see it go on and I'll know that you're ready to chat. Uh, but anyone else, panelists as well, what else comes to mind? Just to fill the void, I'm sorry. Um... Andrew's kind of referenced it obliquely a couple of times with this commit to kids program. Uh, so we're fortunate, the Center for Child Protection uh, is in Winnipeg. And so we had access not just to the programming, but to the people as well. Um, it's very heavy content, the commit to kids program. We had everyone take it, um, athlete facing and admin staff. But we did it like a book club. So we do a module, we'd come back, we discuss it in a staff meeting, you know, what are our questions, what are our learnings? And then at the end, uh, the Center for Child Protection, we had a, a round table and sort of the outstanding questions we still had. Very, very powerful, but I, you know, just like in sport, we sort of encourage you to, to reach a bit, right? Try, maybe it's too much, maybe it's too heavy, but there was so much learning in there, um, that went along with kind of the struggle to understand it and the struggle to get through it. And I, I just, I can't speak highly enough of the program. And if you want to, I guess I make the distinction between a program like that. And I know that we have one in Manitoba that is like a different safe sport educational program that is woven through a lot of what we do. I have to be, I apologize for being the cynic. I just don't find it terribly, a terribly effective or meaningful one. And I guess I would just, if people are looking to reach, and really dive into some meaty topics with their staff to try and uh, understand what they believe and why, I really encourage you to, to look at that program. I also wanna challenge us to think, think bigger, think globally, think nationally. Uh, what are some of the levers we need to really be pulling on for change? Uh, when we talk about governance, for instance, and equipping people to govern well, so that from the, how did someone put it earlier, from the president to the custodian, we are all custodians of the culture, okay? Um, how, do we, how do we pull on, what levers should we be pulling on to make great change across our country, across the world? Uh, Sarinda Kirby was highlighting how, how well we're doing as researchers in Canada. We're right at the cutting edge of a lot of the research in these areas. So talk about being courageous, and calling things out and uh, inquiring and challenging and pushing for change. You know, I think Canada is really being a leader there. What else? 
can we be doing? Local to global. Sorry, that was probably too big of a question. I'm just gonna come off mute. Yes. Um, I think we've been trying really hard to drive change from the top of the system down through policies and procedures and you know, hour long online e-trainings. And I don't know about you, but if I need to do any more of those, I might cry. Um, they're great, but, but that's not how we're gonna make change. Um, we need to drive it from the bottom up. We need the athletes to know what's okay and what's normal and what to do if something isn't. We need parents to know, we need volunteers to know, we need spectators. My goodness me, do we have issues with spectators that we cannot solve. Um, everybody, there has to be a pressure. We have to shift what is normal. It's not normal to shout abuse at a referee. It's really not, that's not okay. And it's, it's, you know, even parents watching their kids play hockey games and yelling at like, what is that? That's not okay. So everybody, we need to shift from the like groundswell so that when leaders say, oh, that's not our problem or that's not my job, people look at them and say, yes, it is. And they won't accept it because at the moment there's just this, um, nobody knows, nobody knows. My, my daughter is 16. She did some coach training when she was 14. And when she was applying for a job, she emailed her coach trainer and said, hey, would you mind being a reference for me? And he emailed back and copied me on the email and said, sure, absolutely, no problem. And she said to me, mom, that was so weird that he copied you on the email. <laughs> and I said, well, it's the rule of two, honey. He had to. And she went, the rule of what? I went, oh my God. Like your mother's a safe sport manager and you're a coach <laughs> and you don't know what this is. Like, what about the other kids in your high school volleyball team? Like uh, nobody knows, nobody knows. So yeah, we need to increase awareness and we're not, you know, we're not doing a very good job of that just yet. So that's, that's another thing I'm trying to fix. Something that I've been coalescing around with all the people I try to talk to around this, and I sure like to talk to lots of people, uh, is the, the power of transparency anywhere across sport. So just what you said, the rule of two, visible, visible interaction. Uh, someone's, you, no one's hiding. You can't hide. If you're hiding, something could, nefarious could occur. Uh, it doesn't mean it is occurring, but it could occur. And as soon as you allow that, the, what is, um, my good friend says that not every, not every coach is a pedophile, but every pedophile wants to coach because we've made it much too easy for them to hide and have access to these little kids. Horrible. So how do we make things transparent? And again, I give a nod to my former coach, Al Morrow, who posted everything, selection, results, criteria, process, everything was open, transparent. Uh, the team, it was obvious to the team who had made the team. You're not having this surprising conversation with the coach. You know what seat you're in. You know where you rank. Uh, you've had to be uh, accountable every single day, but it's all visible all the time. I would never have ever thought of going to his room by myself when we were at a training camp, ever. What, what was it? That was a rule. That was something very clearly established by him, by others, by everyone in the, in the environment. So transparency is something we can fight for at every level. And I, I'm so proud of people calling for the transparency of our NSOs, Sport Canada, on the point, everybody that's uh, leading sport as well. That's a big lever for us. I also want to bring attention to true sport because I remember coming back to true sport and going, um, this is safe sport. Like what? This has been around all the time. Why have we not talked? Why don't we talk about this? Why don't we use this more? It's a bit buried, you know, buried in CCS. And I wonder how do we also the great resources, great artifacts, posters you can have up in your gym telling people not to yell at rest. You know, all sorts of great stuff there. Okay, Megan, you get the last word because we have one. Minute. Oh, I want Elena to have the last word. Um, I uh, I was just going to to jump in there too and say not just at the NSO level but also at the community sport level. If you are at a facility or you you see something, feel free to ask that question. I really encourage all my parents and my coaches that come uh, come through coach training to ask those questions and not just about you know procedure or policy, but you know why is this happening or what's this? Tell me the history behind that because it can be well we've always done it this way. 
And that is where things need to change and need to shift. And it's going to take just those little shifts along the way that can help our little tugboats move this giant ocean liner of sport that um, that we need to to be celebrating and and championing. Beautiful. And don't worry, no big hook is going to come out at 1.30, but keep going. And Atlanta. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And I, I too, Megan took a lot of notes and, and there's a lot that I would love to talk. And, and Jennifer and, and your team and your group, thank you for putting this on because obviously these talks are so important. So I just wanted to highlight a few things. Um, we're working with the SDRCC to create a user-friendly UCCMS, Andreas, just so you know that uh, the work is starting. So um, yeah, anyways, so we can talk about that. That's probably another call. There's, I think, a, a talk tomorrow. So that's one thing. Um, Andrea, again, also thank you for highlighting well being. Um, and I, I'm not plugging this, although I do feel it's so important these mental health podcasts that were created by our athletes. And I mean, they're Nova Scotian athletes, but they're every athlete, they're Canadian athletes, they're our athletes, they are the legacy, right? And so they were created, the topics were created, they are the, the, um, they're giving their stories. There's an expert. Anyways, they should be coming out uh, within the next week or so. And I'll send that to Jennifer to send along. And then the last comment, um, which I didn't get to, which I, I did want to sort of maybe end on um, and, and maybe a topic or, or a discussion point, and certainly I'd love to discuss it with anybody, is this creating this sort of confidence and creating this maybe legacy of confidence and the confidence to try new things and I think back again I have another personal story from my son but trying new things the confidence to fail the confidence to speak up the confidence to step out of your comfort zone I think Megan you talked about being uncomfortable I think I think it was you and so I, I'm interested in this notion and I hope we can continue whoever's interested um, and maybe Jennifer in the future but this this notion of confidence um, and just maybe that's a measure of success is is the confidence to try new things and to fail and to step out and to step forward and and I don't know maybe that's that's where I'll end it uh, again I could go on beautiful and, I, and I'm hearing a need for a part two <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be in touch yeah I think so what a productive conversation we have hundreds of resources concepts identified elements identified here that we can all be working on and uh and being more kind of conscious of and introducing into our, our various environments so thank you all for coming thank you all for your support uh, thank you to our panelists, of course, for their wisdom and their experiences and their hard work, working so hard to advance, advance healthy, safe, inclusive sport uh, into the future for the sake of all those to come. Hey, eh? So they can have those 100% uh, positive experiences that many of us have enjoyed. Wonderful. And yes, the recording will be coming out. We will post these links beyond the chat and into our website so they're readily accessible and they endure. Lots of great things to look at and, and review. And thanks, uh, Jeff, for posting the actual. I was just scanning it quickly and love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, so many great things. All right. Take care. And we'll see you next time. I'll be in touch about uh, the next episode and the date around that and confirming our guests. Take care. <laughs>